Greetings, NSS goers. I'm Sarah Baldwin. The title of my talk is Reverse Faults of the Williamsburg Anticline, Greenberg County, West Virginia, and their effect on speleogenesis. This is brought to you by the sponsorship of the Cave Conservancy of the Virginias who provided support for this project. And also thank you to the West Virginia Association for Cave Studies who provided their field house uh, for doing field work. A special thanks goes to my field assistants, Jennifer Merrick and Margaret Swast. Greenberg County is in southeastern West Virginia. It's largely agricultural. And the Williamsburg anticline, hmm, let's see if I can get a um, laser pointer here. There we go. Uh, the white and the gray areas are limestone. So Lewisburg lies here, Frankfurt here. Um, the yellow and the pink are clastic rocks. Uh, the white and the gray are underlain by the Middle Mississippian Greenberg group, which is a very good uh, karst limestone. Back uh, 40 years ago, when I was a student at West Virginia University, uh, my PhD thesis, for my PhD, I mapped the geology of this area, the Lewisburg Valley, but I never did the Williamsburg Anticline, which is this structure over here. Williamsburg is here. Asbury's about here, Alderson's down here, and Interstate 64 goes right through the middle there. This is a little schematic of an anticline in case you don't know what that is. And thanks to Will White for this diagram. Uh, from my PhD, this is from my PhD thesis, the Green Bar Group in Green Bar County is about 800 feet of limestone with some shaley layers. The bottom is shaley full of chert. The Taggart Formation is a red shale. The Pickaway has a lot of shale. And the Union here is the good cave former and also highly sought after for quarry operations. One really useful tool that I used for my study was laser scanning or LIDAR, where every meter a laser beam would be shot out of an airplane or satellite down to the ground and bounced off. And um, the cool thing about this stuff is that you can see through vegetation, you can see through houses, you can see through thin soils, uh, you can even see through bridges. This stuff is awesome. So this area is very heavily forested. Outcrop is rare. Uh, there's very thick soils and LIDAR was really really useful as a surveying method here. For example, here's a shot of Weaver Knob in the Lewisburg Valley. It's uh, underlain by clastics, and then there's limestone here, which is all cow pasture. Lewisburg is off to the right, there's a quarry up here. You can see a couple scattered outcrops maybe in there, but if you look at the LIDAR image of the same area, you can see the layers in the clastics. Isn't that so cool? You can see where the limestone is exposed by rows of sinkholes here. The quarry, of course, stands out very dramatically. You can see structures in the limestones, folds in the limestones. Uh, it makes a lot of things visible. So um, in the Williamsburg Anticline, I identified some big reverse faults. One of them was identified previously by the 1939 survey by Price and Heck. I identified uh, a few of them 40 years previously in my PhD thesis, that's me. Um, they're recognizable on LIDAR, thank goodness. And they're sometimes recognizable in the field by alignments of sinkholes or streams. Uh, definitely associated in the field with shredded rock and calcite veins and slick and sides. I'll show you all these things. 
They generally involve the Taggart and the Pickaway limestones. The Shale units are more ductile, and those tend to be where the limestone breaks uh, easier. And they have can have as much as 500 feet of stratigraphic displacement, and even more than that, I think, up uh, in the Fort Donnelly area. And I'll show you all this. So here's what our reverse fault looks like. Te the technical definition is the hanging wall went up relative to the foot wall, but these are typically a result of compression. So think of this as Africa, think of this as North America. There's a big scrunch when the Appalachians are uplifted and lots of reverse faults form, um, most especially towards the east in the Valley and Ridge province. And this is sort of a transitional area between the Valley and Ridge and the Appalachian Plateau. So here's the one that was identified by Price and Heck in 39, that's Alderson. And I have this one on my map as well. So this project, I did geologic mapping mainly and identification of the reverse faults and how they affect the caves was just kind of a side project for fun. Here are the reverse faults in um, the Lewisburg Valley. They're kind of small and short. They don't involve a lot of displacement, less than 100 feet typically. But the ones associated with the Williamsburg Anticline are enormous. Um, the, the biggest one is this, what I'm calling the Raider Valley fault zone, the yellow, and the Pierce's Mill fault zone, which is red. The others don't involve quite so much displacement as those two. So um, sometimes on the lighter, they're really obvious. Like here's the droop sandstone uh, up on the side of Raider Valley. And it typically weathers to that lacy pattern, but here it's clearly displaced. And you can even see the fault zone right there. This is a, the old Williamsburg, or sorry, the old Asbury Road right there. And um, so there's um, where I put the fault. This is the, the Mill Creek fault. It's not a big one, especially. But without the LIDAR, you would never see that thing. Very, very heavily forested there. Very little outcrop. Another major fault, the Piercy Mill fault zone. Uh, this is Piercy's Mill Cave, where the lower green bar is tilted to the west here, you're looking north. The fault zone is quite thick here. It's a zone of very closely spaced faults, I think. That's why I'm calling it a fault zone. And then to the west is horizontal upper Greenbrier. Uh, this is the Alderson and the Union down here. Piercy's Cave is off to the left. And um, so there's the fault zone. You can see vertical beds here. This is mostly shredded up pickaway formation and taggered formation. Oh, there I've got the geology on there. The Pierce's Mill fault zone, lower green bar dipping west, the McCrady shale water coming off to the left, um, from right to left, and there's horizontal Union and Alderson. The Lilydale is above the limestone. And there's uh, what Piercy's Mill Cave looks like in the winter. You can see this is probably Patton Limestone. The Taggart's up about there somewhere. And here's the Piercy's Mill Fault Zone, which is pretty much completely covered with soil in this spot. And that's Piercy's Mill Cave. Sometimes in the field where these fault zones are exposed, you can find shredded rock. I call this shredded pickaway. You can find slick sides where uh, you can even feel the motion. Uh, if they haven't weathered away, you can feel which way the, slot, the fault motion went. Uh, here's a piece of shredded pickaway with calcite veins right there. This is just a loose block lying on my back porch. So can you see the fault zone here? This is also the Piercy's Mill fault zone. Here are um, hills underlain by 
Westward Dipping, Lower Green Bar, this is all. Uh, McCready Shale, Bash Cave is one of these, I think this one. And um, then you have very steeply dipping, vertical beds here. Not very many of those are exposed as outcrop and over here, Horizontal Union and Alderson Limestone. So the cave, so the map would put I put the Piercy's no fault zone in with the red lane. It, it red line. It probably extends a little bit to the left also. On the side of Raider Valley, uh, you're looking west. Sorry, east. This is Asbury. North is here. This is Raider Valley. That's a local word for the east side of the anticline. Uh, the next slide is gonna. What's going on here? We've got some what looks like lenticular beds here. The next slide is gonna zoom in on that. Right there, that is the Mill Creek Fault right there, where uh, this side has been pushed up relative to this side. That is a repetition of probably the pickaway. And there's the fault zone right there. This uh, fault I mapped back 40 years ago before we had LIDAR, this is um, looking south from Weaver Knob, a little valley here, a stream sinks right there. And I mapped, because of the displacement, I was able to put a fault right there. But now that I have the LIDAR, check out these cool drag folds visible along that. I thought that was really cool. And another example of a minor fault on LIDAR, horizontal beds here of probably the Alderson. And on this side of the hill and on this side of the hill, we have a big drag fold and a fault. Uh, this is also the Mill Creek Fault uh, where we have uh, beds coming together right there, I think you can see those. So I thought I was seeing things when I looked at that. I thought, what is that? Is that some kind of a cross bedding or lenticular beds? No, no, that's the Mill Creek Fault. And sure enough, when I went down this road and checked up, I could find shredded rock and slick and slides. Dead giveaway. And without that LIDAR, you'd never see it. It's just very hard to get to for one thing and completely forested. Sometimes the faults are easy to spot because of lines of sinkholes. This is the poor farm area, the east limb of the northeast limb of the Williamsburg Anticline. And those are some minor reverse faults. These two just repeat the Alderson limestone and this one is the Raider Valley Fault Zone. So we have a lot of displacement here. Uh, this is Lower Greenbrier. This is Alderson. Uh, maybe there's a sliver of Pickaway in there and McCready over here on the west. If you look at that same area, Colerson Creek cuts right across it here. Uh, there's a bridge. You can actually walk up the road across all these faults, but the LIDAR shows some really cool drag faults right in there. Those are not visible from the ground. Trust me, I look for them. This is the Fort Donnelly area. Just a little bit of lower Greenbrier is faulted up right next to the Alderson, even the Lilydale in this area. There's a lot of displacement on that yellow line. The pink line is the uh, McCready contact below the limestone. So there's my uh, west-east cross section looking north along that same area. I apologize for the pencil sketches. I am really no good with graphic design. I'm much more comfortable with pencil and eraser, but that's the, um, that's the same area. If I go back to here, ye uh, yellow, green, and pink, uh, we have the Raider Valley Fault, the Fort Donnelly Fault, and I, I've since named this the Williamsburg East Fault, but these are just re repetitions of the Alderson. This is the big one here. 
but there is shredded limestone and slick insides uh, visible on the Fort Donnelly Road. Uh, here's an unnamed creek in Raider Valley uh, that follows that pink fault, pretty obviously strongly influenced by um, steeply dipping beds. So what about the caves? Um, this is a cave that was discovered by William Davies. It's in Davies' book, Caverns of West Virginia. Um, we, Bill Jones and I uh, actually mapped that thing. It's not a big cave. I don't know who that person is. I haven't seen her for 40 years. Uh, but if you, oh, okay. So here is the water flowing across this little hollow and hits that uh, fault and goes underground, plop. And you would think that it would follow the cave, uh, the fault, I mean, but it doesn't. It just kind of goes off in this direction, maybe a little section of that last bit of the cave before it siphons, follows the fault. Culverson Creek Cave is a major fault zone. Um, I'm, excuse me, a major cave which takes uh, Culverson Creek. It has a lot of miles and there is a fault nearby, um, which the Triple S entrance is on, but the cave doesn't follow the fault zone at all. So just from my thesis 40 years ago, it doesn't look like the caves are influenced at all by the faults. Although those two were pretty small faults. Piercy's Mill Cave lies on this big fault zone here that's looking out of the entrance. And on the map of Piercy's Mill, there is kind of a straight section here that does kind of line itself up nicely with the Piercy's Mill fault zone. So that's, that yellow line is my version of the Piercy's Mill cave. Um, and the red zone, uh, Piercy's Mill fault zone is red here. So there does, at least they're parallel. A cross section would look like this, where here's Piercy's Mill Cave, this is Piercy's Cave. This one's in the Patton Limestone, this one's in the Union. And there's the uh, shredded pickaway in the Piercy's Mill Fault Zone. This fault zone is exposed on Highway 12, by the way. Um, so it's really uh, easy to get a good look at it there. Oh, and I should mention that streams come off McCready here and sink at the contact with the limestone. And one of those is Bash Cave. Looks like that. That's the little stream that sinks. Uh, this map is oriented so north is here. You can see that the cave is roughly linear, going uh, trending kind of northwest a little bit there, which seems odd because regional strike is northeast. But if we put that on the fault zone, or on the LIDAR, I should say, uh, that's my version of bash on the LIDAR. And it does pretty much line up with these sinkholes and the Piercy's Mill fault zone, which is that big red line. So the entrance to bash is uh, right there. And most of the cave doesn't cross that fault, but it does go parallel to it, most of the caves turning out to be done here, I think, towards Asbury. And inside the cave, you can see that it's following those steeply dipping layers of limestone. These are mostly Patton and Sinks Grove, probably. And I showed you this one earlier. I'm calling that the Mill Creek Fault. It's exposed on the side of Raider Valley. And um, Mark Passerby mapped a cave that's very linear called Zikafu's Cave. This is the old Asbury Road. Um, and I'll, I juxtapose that one on the LIDAR. This is Zikafu's Cave, the Mill Creek Fault, the Raider Valley Fault Zone. And it is roughly following the fault zone there. Another very linear cave I noticed was uh, the bag system, the two entrances, plastic and paper. So what I did was I, I located the paper bag entrance by latitude and longitude 
and plotted this line on the LIDAR. It didn't work out too well because um, it looks like the cave actually crosses the fault. I really suspect I may have the fault in the wrong place here. It's not a major fault and it's petering out at this at, towards the end. So perhaps uh, I got the fault in the wrong place or the cave in the wrong place. There's always a possibility too. So in conclusion, um, I identified extensive reverse faults by lighter Im imagery and also with field work associated with the Williamsburg anticline. Um, the reverse faults occasionally have topographic expression as linear streams or lines of sinkholes. Culverson Creek and Taylor Falls caves do not seem to follow the nearby reverse faults. Piercy's Mill, Bash, Zikafus, and the Bag System all show linear passages on or near the fault zones, probably due to the solution following strongly tilted layers near the fault, or perhaps groundwater flow along the fault itself or shatter zones associated with the fault. And none of the passages seems to cross the faults, which implies that if groundwater flow is affected at all, it flows along or parallel to those fault zones. So an interesting study was done by uh, Bill Jones a few years ago. This is in Will White's book. He put dye in Sinking Creek here, Hugart Creek here. Uh, he traced the dye through this big hole right below the Interstate 64 here. This is called Interstate Lake. Ponars is where the water sinks in Interstate Lake. It pools up here and then sinks. And he traced it to Piercy's Mill Cave and to Piercy's, but the weird thing was um, it all, uh, not surprisingly, all that water came out of Piercy's Mill Cave, but when it came out of Piercy's, it came out much slower and uh, a lot um, later, it appeared a lot later and didn't seem to go through Interstate Lake, you know? So maybe that water was just following uh, the fault zone here. So uh, thank you for listening. Uh, there should be an email address associated um, with this slideshow where you can ask questions. So uh, I'm going to end.